Welcome to 11 Stories from the River Joabin's Audio Walk at Macquarie Park in Freeman's Reach. Naya Diara. My name's Indiana. Jaden. Lyra. Rhiannon. Byron. Butchery. Darren. Urian. We speak well of the Darug people. Nalaya. You're Barang. Darug. Nogu. The people we belong to on Dark Country. We pay respects to our elders, past, present, and emerging. We welcome you to Darug Country. Walk with us in the footsteps of our ancestors. Nara, Dabu, Listen to the stories of our Jurabin. The liver Jurabin is our ancestor, a living, breathing being, sung into existence from creation. In Dog Delang, Dog Language, there are places along the river that speak of her body, like Noang Gurai, a little leg. Gurugang, kneecap. Gubai, arm. Mama, fingers. Dargu, jawbone. And Milo, eyes. The river is a sacred highway of connection, holding our dreaming creation stories and songlines across countries and nations. Jurabin tells a shared creation story of Gurungach, the great eel. For Gunungar, Dawu, Wiradjuri, Dog, Darkenyung, and Gurungar countries. Remember Midika? Tread softly on the streaming. We were strong here. We remain strong here. We will always be strong here. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander listeners are advised that this audio walk contains stories of historical violence, Aboriginal people now resting in the dreaming, and the voices of recently departed Darakan community elders. Listen and enjoy the stories, but please do not reproduce them in any way. Thank you. Guyanma, come. Let's walk down towards the river till you reach the big chakaranda tree. My name's Leanne Watson. I'm a Buruburongal woman from the Darug tribe. My connections go back to Yellamundi. The river to me means life and it's our creation story. Our people tended to spend a lot of time around permanent water. The river out here was a really big area for yams, part of our staple diet. In our culture, we didn't waste anything, so they would have been replanted for the next time that we were out there to collect them. They were definitely cultivated. So people just spent a lot of time around the rivers because you had the mullet, you had the freshwater mussels, your crayfish, and then all the plants that are associated with the waterways too and wetlands. You look at the country now, some areas that you go to away from the river are very barren and dry, whereas you've got everything near the river that you'd need. Grace Kalskins, Emeritus Professor of History at the University of New South Wales and author of People of the River. The early officers wrote down the name for the river as D. Rubbin. Usually the D comes with a J, Jarabin. And I came across a word exactly like that in Gadangara. Often there's 50% cognate words, so the words overlap. So if you find one in one language, it could easily be in another one as well. It's just that it hasn't been recorded. And to me, Diraban, that word means yam, Diraban. There's also a word in Darknyung, Juribang, it's for creek. It has something to do with a watercourse. Again, it could mean watercourse and yam. 
because names sort of shared like eel and rainbow they became the same word well, it happens in english too same word for two different things so another example is kurajong which is a tree it's also a number of plants they all are linked by the fact that you can make string and line out of them and the kurajong as we used to call it is obviously a place where women used to go and get that material Yara. Let's turn left and head downstream. We're looking for a rock engraving hidden in amongst the trees. It's near a yellow caution sign. If it looks too overgrown, you might prefer to walk up along the top of the bank and approach it from above. Here on the floodplain, we're in the heart of the rich alluvial soils where people cultivated yams on the riverbanks, as noted on the exploratory trips in 1789. The natives here appear to live chiefly on the roots which they dig from the ground. For these, low banks appear to have been ploughed up as if a vast herd of swine had been living on them. We put ashore, examined the places which had been dug and found the wild yam in considerable quantities but in general very small, not larger than a walnut. They appear to be in the greatest plenty on the banks of the river. A little way back, they are scarce. Hunter, 1793. These fertile plains, so prized for farming, were quickly taken up by colonists in 1794 and have been farmed ever since. They were once covered in dugga dugga with a flat forest. Across the river you can see Bolgan Narung, the place our people called Hill Camp, the only hill by the river in this area, a safe place in the highest of floods. If you spotted the caution sign, head up in amongst the Gamung Hajarina trees. The rock engraving is low to the ground and may be hard to find. It's about three to four metres down from the top of a riverbank. On the ground here is a plaque beside a large rock with an engraving. It recognises our ancestor Yaramundi and his meeting in 1791 with Governor Philip. Just down the river at Bardo Narung Creek, it was created by Burabarongal, Darek, Elder, Auntie Edna Watson, my great-grandmother and her sisters in 1999 with Uncle Alan Watson, my great-grandfather. Dr Stubbs was the Mayor of Hawkesbury Council and Dr Stubbs' relations with some of the first settlers out here in the Hawkesbury and he said his relations used to shoot Edna's relations. So there was a bond between them mm. and the terrible things that happened because he knew all the history from right back, white and black history of what happened. He wanted something good for the area at Macquarie Park and they decided on the first meeting between black and white, which was Jaramundi and Governor Phillip. We went out, direct land out here to Annan Grove, and we picked out the rock. Mm. Edna and the sisters carved Jaramundi's feet with the spear hole, his footprints holding his spear beside it, and the boot prints of Governor Phillip and the print of the butt of a rifle. So that was the simplest way Edna and the sisters worked out of telling the story of the mm. meeting between Yarramundi and Governor Phillip. So we had the official opening and lots and lots of people come. Mm. We had the dancers and Edna and the sisters did the welcome to country and then Dr Stubbs was the first councillor or politician. And he stood up and he apologised for all the bad things that had mm. happened. He said he's sorry, sorry. And nobody in that audience that knew that he was going to say that. And my two sisters and I were there, and a lot of our cousins. And 
It was such a shock and we started to cry because we thought somebody has said that they were sorry for everything that happened to us. And all the other council people there, they were shocked mm. to hear Dr mm. Stubbs. After it was all over, Edna did a painting yep. of the rock, mm. the dancers, mm. the ditch players, her and her sisters and Dr Stubbs in the river. Mm. And Dr Stubbs bought the painting. Yeah, he did. Mm. And he presented it to the council. Might be still hanging it's in the council. It's still hanging in the council. Because he was our doctor for a while. Yeah. But he told us a lot of things about what went on. Yeah. Mm. And he said that a lot of the things that happened to the Aboriginal people are true as far as poisoning and shooting yeah. and mm. doing a lot of terrible things. Yeah. Because it's all been passed down through the families. Mm. And that's why he had a bond with yeah. Edna or with our yep. family. You know? Yeah. Mm. On Torrey Day, we all gather out there. Then they walk down to the rock. And if there's a lot of new people there, I explain to them what the memorial is. Former Mayor and longest serving councillor of Hawkesbury City Council, Dr Rex Stubbs, was a descendant of six generations of Hawkesbury families. Free settlers William and Sarah Stubbs arrived on the ship, the Coromandel, in 1802 and were granted 100 acres on the river at Portland Head. Their farm was repeatedly raided by Aboriginal warriors. After pursuing warriors in 1805, William Stubbs drowned while crossing the river. His young son William, who was eight, witnessed the tragedy, unable to help. We're going to continue downstream to the viewing platform where Windsor's first bridge used to be. If you keep walking towards the end of the park, you'll see a concrete footpath near the roadway entry. Turn right on the footpath to head to the viewing platform close to the bridge. From here, we can see downriver towards the mouth of Reanimata South Creek and Jeroba, our corroboree place there. This was the place colonisation began on the river in 1794. In 1794, things start to take a turn for what we would have to call an invasion. From an Aboriginal point of view, you can't describe it any other way. A band of about 20 people come from the earlier settlements on the east coast and they go to what is now called Pitt Town Bottoms, which is one of those places on South Creek which is reportedly free of trees. They're a long way apart and they start clearing a bit, spread themselves along that reach and start putting in wheat and corn. It soon became pretty obvious that you didn't have to work as hard on a farm on the river as you did in some of the other areas. Word got out in the community and more and more people, it's the first land rush, 400 within a few months. From 1794, land along both sides of the river from Wangi Wilberforce, just downstream on the side of the river and upstream towards Moangnua, Richmond, was taken by the British government without any agreement from our people. Riverside land was then granted to mostly ex-convict settlers who cleared trees and began to farm. It became more and more difficult for our people to access our foods and resources. Our people raided Riverside farms to survive and to fight against this invasion of our country. Settlers continued to arrive and clear our country to make their farms, as the fertile banks of Jurabin produced an abundance of crops. This fertile spot had in some seasons produced from 15 to 20,000 bushels of wheat and might justly be termed the granary of New South Wales. Holland, 1795. At the viewing platform, we're standing on the last remains of Windsor's first bridge, opened in 1874 and demolished in 2021. Prior to that, a punt crossed the river before the first bridge was built. Let's take the concrete path under the new bridge now, still heading downstream till we reach the other side of the bridge. 
John Cobcroft was an ex-convict committed of highway robbery near London in 1788. He was granted land in two grants on the river, just downstream of here on Wilberforce Reach. By 1828, he had 485 acres, cultivating 130 of those and running 300 cattle. His wife Sarah came out as a free settler on the same ship. The couple had 10 children and Sarah became a district midwife. The Cobcroft family retained the original grant until 1985. Across the river from here on the highest point of the Bulgar Hill was where Government House was in the early days of the colony. In 1810, Governor Macquarie declared the five Macquarie towns following his tour of the area. The place our people called Wangi, possibly meant children's place, or place of the seven boo book hour. Today it's known as Wilberforce. Macquarie named it after William Wilberforce, the British MP and leader of the movement to abolish the slave trade. When you're ready, head back under the bridge following the concrete pathway into Macquarie Park. The park was named after Governor Lachlan Macquarie, who from 1810 to 1821 served as the fifth governor of New South Wales. We'll head back towards the jacaranda tree where we started. Macquarie did have this real commitment to the colony as a convict colony. This was for ordinary people, this colony. It wasn't for these well-heeled settlers that wanted everything for free. And I think it has something to do with the fact that he came from a very humble background himself. His mother was illiterate. He lived in a mud hut off the coast of Scotland. So he comes from the same background as a lot of the people who were convicts. And the other thing about him is he is a great showman. So you do the whole toast and you make proclamations and you appear before the people. He's very 18th century. And, you know, he's really the only governor that was very much admired and fated by the ordinary people of Sydney. And when he came to say goodbye, everybody turned up and everyone had the candles and... It's very moving to think of that. However, Macquarie is also someone who wants to make his own history. Like a lot of people from humble background, he's dead keen to leave his mark. Today, I waved my hand and I proclaimed five new towns, not saying that the town was already there and had been for 15 years. And of course, I'm talking about Windsor. So he did not found the town of Windsor. He did proclaim Richmond, Castlereagh and Wilberforce and Pitt Town. We just had huge floods in 1809, just before he got here. That's why he founded the towns on the ridges, to be out of the way of the floods. The other thing is that people didn't move into the towns. They didn't want to leave the river flats at all because towns mean surveillance. They also mean that your farm is vulnerable to Aboriginal attack, bush rangers. You know, you need to be on your farm. And also the ex-convicts in particular, they would never have had a chance at having a farm in England. Imagine that, 30 acres of really beautiful land. Are you kidding me? <laughs> They're not going to leave it to go and live in a town. And they had a mentality that allowed them to cope with floods. We're terrified of floods, but they didn't have so much stuff as we do. When the flood went through, oh well, at least you got some good silt on your land and you started again. I remember in the 2010, the bicentenary, there was an outpouring of celebration of Macquarie. You know, he was a character, people do love him, and he did a lot of wonderful things. But nobody talked about the Appen Massacre or the native school where he kidnapped all these Aboriginal children and stuck them in this dreadful school in Parramatta and then moved it out to Blacktown. I think Macquarie was very good at controlling information and so when he heard about Appen, he, he kind of muffled the report of it because he knew that innocent people had been killed. It was a massacre. The rest of the campaign, Macquarie handed over to William Cox, who's the magistrate here in the Hawkesbury. And Cox organises all these military and police parties, which include settlers, including police constables, and also, has to be said, some Aboriginal guides. And they spent the next eight months roaming up and down the river in the mountains on either side, just hunting and killing Aboriginal people. And that is what led to the final surrender at the end of 
1816 and people come to the big corroboree at Parramatta and that's supposed to be the grand reconciliation and the women are weeping and classic Sydney Gazette says oh they're weeping because they're so happy to see their children in the native institution able to say their prayers but of course they're weeping for what's happened I think. Governor Macquarie didn't want to be remembered as the exterminator of native people he wanted to be the good governor and of course that is how he's mostly actually remembered. And it's not really the end either because they keep fighting on the river. There's incidents all the way through the 1820s. It's just not the full-on coordinated constant attacks that happened, but they, they do keep on happening. Frontier violence, disease, and military and settler campaigns such as these took a huge toll on our people, but we survived. Darug and Darkin young people continued to live along the river, on Noora, country. Many of our women were raped or forced to marry into settler families and many of our children were stolen. In the late 1800s, the Aboriginal Protection Board established a reserve downstream on a narrow, steep riverbank at Sackville, where some of our people lived. Some settlers remained friendly to Aboriginal people, allowing them to live and work on their farms. Let's continue upstream, towards the steps that lead down to the jetty near Windsor Beach. There's a narrow dirt track along the top of the river bank beyond the jacaranda tree where we started. My name's Tony Toms. My grandfather had a boat shed from the early 50s and that was opposite the bridge. They were in a line from about 50 metres short of the bridge and I can remember from probably late 50s, maybe 60s, going over there for weekends and I spent a little of my school holidays. There was a cruiser he lived on in the middle and there was seven or eight boats in front which were all open boats, six or seven half cabin boats behind it and a rowing boat or two, and all tied up to a big wire rope. When the floods came, he just hooked all the boats behind the boat he lived on, and it was hanging off this wire rope, and it just floated up to the top of the bank on the flood, and then floated back down again. And then he put all his boats out, and away he went again. He had the wharf, a three-level wharf to get on and off boats. He had a slipway a bit further to, up towards the bridge and a big old winch to winch them up and down uh, that had like a little trolley that the boat sat on. But he built most of the boats, I think, out of plywood and built me a canoe. If I caught eels, the lady at the shop up near where the roundabout now is gave me an ice cream. The granddad used to skin them. All the drink bottles that came out of the boats, I got tripping seats for them. You know, Granddad usually carried them up the hill. <laughs> yeah, I learned to swim between his boat and the bank when the tide was up and there was a bit of sand there. The water was lovely and clear. But the water's been dirty ever since. There was a sandbar from the bridge two thirds of the way to South Creek. And there was dredging there for years and years. And there was a sandbar below the creek. And there was always elves and cruisers stuck on the bank. <laughs> there was a lot of elves and cruisers used to come all the way up to Windsor and all the way back again. The boat ramp was up near the Windsor Bridge. It was still partly there a couple of years ago. Granddad lived on the river from the late 50s, boat he lived on. The story I got was it was Jack Lang's speed cruiser. It was the old type of speed cruiser. He sold his boat shed in the late 60s. And I have a feeling it might have been the 68 flood that took it, because that was a big flood, I think. My 
Most of the lowlands of Wangi Wilberforce are now turf farms. Though maize, wheat, vegetable, cattle and citrus have also been farmed here in the last 230 years. Before that, our people grew yams for tens of thousands of years on these fertile river flats. For many farmers, working the floodplain through successive floods, turf was the only crop able to withstand short periods of flooding. Turf is one of the Hawkesbury's largest industries, with the river as its prime irrigator. In the early days of settlement, much of the produce farmed along the river was transported to Sydney by boat. But by the 1880s, ongoing floods and river bank erosion caused the river to silt up and large boats could no longer make it along the river to Windsor. With the establishment of steam navigation, excursions from Sydney to Windsor became more popular. In 1873, the steamer, the Pelican, would depart Sydney at 5.30am, entering Broken Bay, the river's mouth, by 8am. The trip from Sydney to Windsor took about 10 and a half hours. More recently, in the late 1980s, the Lady Hawkesbury, a large nearly 2,000 tonne cruise boat, regularly ran between Brooklyn and Windsor on short weekend trips. She would carefully turn around near the Windsor Bridge, with little room between the ship and the riverbanks. In the 1988 flood, the Lady Hawkesbury was stranded here, as there wasn't enough height between the river and power lines at Wilberforce for her to pass. In the 1990s, a tour boat called the Jarabin ran trips from Windsor to Port Erangai and Brooklyn. Since 1996, the paddle wheeler could be seen moored in the river here at Windsor, built and launched in 1976. It's one of the few genuine paddle wheelers still in operation in Australia. Tony told us about the sand dredging of the river here in Windsor. The river has also been dredged for sand at Pitttown, North Ridgeman and now Mundy and has recently been improved again just upstream at Freeman's Reach. Kevin Rizzoli, Hawkesbury's longest standing state member of parliament, was elected to Windsor Municipal Council in 1968 and has been a tireless advocate for the health of the river and the catchment as a whole. In the 60s, the amount of sand and gravel extraction which was starting to take place over which there were no controls, there were no conditions. It became obvious to me very quickly that this was very bad for long-term future of the river. And they were just carving great chunks out of the, the river, the bed and the banks. The Hawkesbury Valley, as we refer to it, was a very friable alluvial floodplain. Therefore, it was very fragile and with the big floods that we would have, the scouring from those floods alone was bad enough to disturb the river's structure. And we finally brokered the first conditions ever put on an extractive industry in New South Wales. And they were known as the 42 conditions. And the extractive industry people weren't too pleased about all this, but as time went on, grew to see the value of it and a lot of that manifested itself in the conditions under which what is now known as the Penrith Lakes Development Corporation, which became a world-renowned model for sand and gravel extraction and for rehabilitation and restoration post the extraction period. With all these sort of questions being thrown up and not too many solutions, I decided that what the river needed was an authority which could take care of the river in its entirety. The whole catchment, because all that has a bearing. Now, the Hawkesbury to be in catchment is huge. The river system from its furthest point to the, the mouth is about 570 kilometres. It's all linked. The whole of the environment is like linked one thing to another. You just can't take any part of the environment absolutely on its own. After 20 years of advocacy, Kevin Rosoli was pivotal in the establishment of a New South Wales Government Regulatory Authority for the River in 1993. The Hawkesbury Nepean Catchment Management Trust looked after the whole Hawkesbury Nepean Catchment 
until it was axed overnight in 2001, to be replaced by a succession of free government agencies, all of which have been abolished. We'll stop a while when we reach the steps and the ramp that lead down to the jetty. Dr Ian Wright, Associate Professor of Environmental Science from Western Sydney University. We've extracted so much sand and gravel out of the river and that was a really important part of its physical makeup. In high flow events, the eroded sediment is actually a really important part of the stream environment. We've changed it forever. So there are areas that are now deep that used to be much shallower. So they had shoals. They've been removed. Thousands and thousands and thousands of tonnes. We don't take anything like as much out of the river now, but we take it out of the floodplain. And all of that changes the river. We change the flow, we change the sediment, we've changed land uses, and we've discharged waste into it. And surprise, surprise, the river's as good as it is. I think the Hawkesbury and Pern River is one of Australia's most important rivers. And it provides... 90-something percent of the water supply for our biggest city. It has incredibly bountiful floodplains, important for fruit, for vegetables, for employment, for agriculture. It's a highly valued waterway for people's recreation, for fishing, for boating, for swimming. We've got value upon value upon value. Who manages the river? What's the plan to protect it? I'm not sure there is one. I'm not aware of it. I often get asked, so who is the management authority for this river? There is none, in my opinion. And I'd love to be corrected here. It's not the EPA. EPA will look after some of the discharge points and regulate them. I don't believe they do that very well. They certainly do not manage the river. It's not Department of Planning. They have a role. It's not Water New South Wales that own Warragamba Dam, Avon Dam, Cataract Dam, etc. Pipelines and canals. They have a role, but it's only a fragment. It's not Sydney Water that run the sewage treatment plants. It's not local councils. There is no coordination body that looks after all the different aspects that affect the state of that river. And so it's like an out-of-control bus. To me, in Australia, if something's important, you have a plan, you measure things, and you share that information. At the moment, I can't find out anything about water quality or the programs and policies to achieve better water quality with this onslaught of development. We're going to see so much more with Badgeries Creek Airport being constructed now and with the ongoing urban and commercial development with southwest Sydney and northwest Sydney. All that happens to be in the Hawke's Binapan catchment. My biggest concern is the water quality coming out of South Creek. That is essentially like a giant polluting liquid chimney disgorging waste into the Hawkesbury, into the most beautiful location near Wilberforce. I know people swim in the river. I think that's dangerous. I swim in the river. I know it's a risk. I'm careful about putting my head under. But if I go for a swim at the beach on the coast or in a harbour beach, I know that's been sampled every six days. They collect bacteria to look at the chances of human contamination. The Hawkesbury and the Pen is the beach of the West for so many communities. Windsor Beach is really popular. You can get hundreds of people here on really hot days. I've got my hands on some government data and the river generally is good for swimming, generally. But there are times when it is absolutely not good and those results are shared with the community. And I think that's dangerous, irresponsible and risky. If you feel up to it, head down the stairs or ramp to the jetty. Hello, my name is Jen Dolan. I remember growing up here and eating eels out of the river from when I was five. My family would just take us out as they were Ukrainian and mad for eels and we would just go fishing for eels. They would get really big heavy lines with any piece of old meat on it, as I can remember. And we'd go to particular places that somehow they knew to go to that were eel places. Thinking about it, it must have been from Mum's time in the Skyville camp. 
because she knew all the back places in the Hawkesbury to go fishing for eels. They must have all just come here and found pretty quickly places to eat and to get food. <laughs> so Mum told me that she would soak the eels in buttermilk to soften them and take the skin off and then slice them like little steak fillets and fry them. My grandfather, my Jadushka, would go fishing and he would come home and they had a little smoking pit up the back near the chicken shed and he would half smoke them essentially over a fire and have smoked eels. And it was also, I guess, from the old country, the traditions of food there were to braise and slow cook everything. But some of my earliest memories are also from my grandfather being alive and going with big Ukrainian picnics to Windsor Beach and having picnics by the beach there, really clear river, really, really clear. This is my thinking around my mother being here from 1959 and about the river. So they came out here as Polish refugees and started a life here. River, Ryczka, 1959. I can't exactly remember when the river was clear. Mum said it used to be when she was young. Biloko, Borisko, Selbulski and Slavinski kids would sneak to the Hawkesbury River after school. European skins warmed by Australian sun. They learned to swim in the dams at camp, then graduated to jumping off the pylons at Windsor Bridge. It was safe because you could see the bottom. English, 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 they were told but the Eastern Bloc stuck together. Polish, Hungarian, German, Ukrainian and Latvian. Zika, Folio, Flus, Ryczka, Upu. The other local kids never acknowledged them. Not at school, on the bus, nor at the river. After all, they were here first, don't you know? <laughs> When we were 11 or 12, we were at high school, Windsor High, we'd come down, so our excursions or the end of year celebrations were on the river. And I remember then being able to swim across the river and it being yeah, clear. 70s and 80s, kids would swing off ropes and jump into the river. The whole community were entangled in the river always. I think the exciting but scary things were the floods and the big floods because the floods were nature out of control and we just saw the whole area inundated, just inundated with water. It was extraordinary. Directly over the river from us here on the Windsor side, a large section of the riverbank slumped during the major flooding in 2021 and 2022. This type of riverbank erosion occurred in many places along this part of the river, following those floods. Areas of the riverbank which are well vegetated with grasses, shrubs and trees are less likely to be affected. New South Wales government legislation protects vegetation within 40 metres of riverbanks, but this is not always followed. We're going to continue upstream. Let's head back up the ramp or stairs. From there, you might like to make your way down to walk along the beach or stay along the top of the riverbank. In 1846, the first regatta was held here for two and four oared boats, skulls and... Canoes for either Aboriginals or whites with a pair of paddles. The course extended from... A boy moored off Old Ben's Point, opposite the pumping station, thence round a boy moored off the Peninsula Bank. Michael Kemp lives on the river. His four times great-grandfather was a champion rower. He was at the first regatta here at Windsor. Two of the Kemps, a great-great-grandfather and his brother, had been long-time champions of the Hawkesbury. They had regattas at Windsor from the 1840s. My four times great-grandfather, Thomas Huxley, was racing there. Now, apart from 
a couple of early ones in Sydney. That's one of the earliest regattas in Australia. When they first started racing, they used a cannon fired to start the race and they'd row from the willow tree down to such and such as wharf and back past when it was a ferry, a bridge there. Well, on the Windsor side, there'd be all tents with streamers and there'd be puppeteers and all sorts of stalls and things and people would come from all over the colony to watch these big races. So my four-time great-grandfather was a champion with his brother and two other blokes in, in a four. Peter Kemp arrived in 1832 and was assigned to Alexander Books down on Webbs Creek. And he was a ship builder, boat builder farmer and somewhere along the way Peter Kemp met Sophia Huxley and the Huxleys had settled at Paradise Point in 1798 at Lower Portland there, the mouth of the Colo. And they lived down there in the, the Colo, Lower Portland there. And yeah, it's a wonderful story. They all were rowers. So Peter Kemp's sons, five of them all become rowers and their grandfather was a rower. So. Kemp family had been rowing for 200 years and it'd have to be one of the longest rowing families in Australia, I think. Peter Kemp's son, Peter Kemp, was world champion and that was huge in the days. To be champion scholar of the world was the biggest sports champion you could be, bigger than boxing and horse racing. Hundreds of thousands of people would watch the races and they would get thousands of pounds for a win. And I still row. In the late 1800s, Windsor Beach was also home to the Hawkesbury Swimming Club. And in 1896, the Male Championship of Australia was held at Windsor, with entries from as far as New Zealand and Queensland. It was won by Percy Cavill of New South Wales and in 28 minutes, a record time for a straight mile in fresh water. A special train ran from Sydney to Windsor. The river was alive with boats and 1,500 spectators. Exhibitions of high diving were given from a platform on the bridge about 40 feet or 12 metres above the water. Suspense was provided for the 1,500 spectators when Mr J Kelly performed the Monte Cristo feat from off the bridge. Tied in a sack loaded with ballast and securely fastened with a new rope, Mr. Kelly was under the water for a long time, and when he rose, he brought with him the sack, whole and sound, also the rope with which it was tied. No knife was used to cut the inmate's way out of the sack. Windsor and Richmond Gazette, January 1896. In 1963, Hawkesbury Swimming Club left the river and began to function out of Richmond Pool. As we walk along Windsor Beach, we're at the start of a significant bend in the river. The short straight around the bend is Argyle Reach. Across the river, you can see the mouth of Wickerby's Creek and beyond it, the farms of Cornwallis. Before Europeans colonised the area, their early explorers recorded description of the tall, thick forest that grew along the river flats we call Dugga Dugga. They also noted that creek junctions were often clear and open. In 1792, it was recorded that at the mouth of Rickaby's Creek... The forest is not very thick, nor are the trees. Richard Atkins, 1792. Our people favoured creek and river junctions as gathering places and kept them clear with fire. They would have been good places to camp, launch Nawi, canoes, and for women to harvest yams. Beyond the end of the beach, there is no obvious track and the vegetation becomes increasingly overgrown as we round the bend. The trees laden with debris following the 2022 floods. Continue only if you feel safe to do so, or you might prefer to find somewhere here to sit as we look over this part of the river. In the early days of the colony along the river, several young Aboriginal boys were murdered on the farms of Cornwallis, just opposite us as we round the bend. 
When we think about those early farms, the farmers were only using that very front part on the rivers, the alluvial part, and then the backs of them were still bush and they weren't fenced. So of course, Aboriginal people kept using them. They kept walking through them. They kept moving around their sacred sites and ritual grounds and camping grounds, just like they had done for thousands of years. And one day in September 1794 at Cornwallis, a group of Aboriginal people were seen at the back of a farm and they were just in the bush part and the settlers saw them there and thought they were going to attack. And a boy came forward and the settlers grabbed him and tied him up and tortured him by dragging him back and forth through a fire. And then they threw him in the river, still bound, and shot him dead. Now his people would have seen that happen. If you try to think of it from a Darug point of view, we know that young boys in Aboriginal society generally were sent forward often as envoys, as people who could make communication with the other group. That's possibly what this boy was sent to do. The settlers later said they thought he was coming to spy on them to see if they had guns and said they didn't have guns. That wasn't true. In Aboriginal law, if you commit a crime like that, you have to pay the price. It has to be an equanimity in justice. So the person who commits the crime or their relative or their countrymen must pay a price. And that is what happened. The Darug attacked a neighbor, George Shadrach, and his servant and beat them and speared them so badly they nearly died. That was obviously payback for the loss of this boy. But there were lots of raids, Darug people raiding the farms, taking all the food and the clothing in an attempt to drive out these invaders. Following a series of raids, the settlers formed a posse and shot into a camp of Aboriginal people in the area, killing seven or eight people. This is the first recorded massacre of Aboriginal people perpetrated by settlers in modern Australian history. Our school, Windsor South Public, is further up Rickabees Creek. There are about 80 Aboriginal kids at our school learning Darug the Long, Darug language on Nura country. My name is Erin Wilkins. I am a Burrabrongal Darug woman from my paternal grandfather. My mother's side of the family came out to Windsor in the 1840s from Scotland. So I have both backgrounds hovering around Windsor. A lot of the water birds or waterfowl on the river, the men would come down with the boomerangs and the boomerangs would be thrown in multiples high up to the sky in front of the sun to cast a shadow while there's plenty of waterfowl on the water. So they'd throw the boomerangs up and as it passes the sun, it casts a shadow and the wingspan would kind of resemble the wingspan of Eaglehawk. The noise of the boomerang returning is like a noise. Again, uh, imitation of the flapping of an Eaglehawk's wings. But that would be not as a hunting mechanism, it'd be a herding mechanism. So it'd be kind of pushing the ducks or the water birds along the river line and heading them into the bird nets that have been woven massive metres by metres that they'd string up in trees across the river lines. And the women would string nets across a bend in the river. When the ducks fly, they fly close to the water. So when you come round the bend, they can't see that quickly and they fly into the net. Grandmother, Auntie Asna Watson, is a fifth generation descendant of the Darug leader Yarramundi. Earlier on the walk, we saw Auntie Edna's engraving of Yarramundi's footprints. A lot of people, they don't know that there was a tribe here. They say, oh, don't they come from all over Australia? Even when we go into the schools, the teachers, didn't the tribe in this area Weren't they all wiped out? 
No, they weren't. We're still here. A lot of people think that what happened to Aboriginal children didn't happen in the Sydney area, but I remember the Aboriginal Protection Board coming to our house and my mother always said, don't answer the door, take the little ones and we would run up into the bush and if we couldn't go up into the bush then we would uh, hide under the bed or in a cupboard. And mum always said, don't come out until I come and get you. They came on average every two weeks just to check and see if we were looked after properly, if the house was clean. My mother always made sure that the house was spotless. My mother was a Derrick lady and my father was white. My father brought my mother off the Aboriginal Protection Board for 10 shillings and he treated her like a slave and belted her, something terrible, until he died. Yeah, we went through a lot at school. In the playgrounds, nobody would play with you because everybody knew that we were Aboriginal. When you didn't know what to do with your sums and that, and you asked the teacher and he just said that I didn't really need to know how to read and write because Aboriginal people only got jobs sweeping the gutter and different things like that and you didn't need to learn. My sister got into a fight one day and, and my sister said, this girl called me a black fella and, and the headmaster said, well, you shouldn't have hit her. And my sister said, well, do we have to stand there and be called black fella? And he said, yes, you do. He said, because you are. We went through a lot, but there's a lot of people in our community who were taken away from their family. I wasn't one of the stolen generation, but my culture was stolen from me, and which I have to start all over again and learn. And it would have been so wonderful if my mother and my grandfather had been able to speak the language all the time and also learn more of their culture. So there's a lot of things through that generation that has been taken off Aboriginal people. Drabin holds a shared creation story of Gurungach, the Great Eel, who's twisting and turning for the landscape created in Yura country. Our ancestors carved Gurungach, a rainbow serpent, into rock platforms along the river's length. Geologist Gil Jones lives in the MacDonald Valley and is the author of several books including Wasteland, Wilderness, Wonderland. I've been thoroughly familiar with and taken an interest for decades in rivers, in the landscape, and I've always been struck by their commonly meandering course. Rivers are incredibly dynamic, and particularly rivers within relatively confined floodplains, as we have here often along the course of the Hawkesbury, move snake-like backwards and forwards across their floodplains. And this is a movement that is perceptible on our timescale because you know, I can point to places down on the MacDonald where the river has moved 500 metres in the major floods we had in the 1950s and where its course was formerly down at Fleming's Creek, is now a billabong, which is an abandoned section of channel that dates back only 70 years ago. If you look at aerial photographs of river systems, particularly those in flat floored situations confined between valley sides, you can see in the morphology of the sediments the very clear indications that these rivers are snaking their way along. And I'm sure you've seen the track that a snake makes in dust or loose sand. And it's got a sort of swept look about it with a series of crescents where the body has moved from side to side. Go to aerial photographs of floodplains and you will see exactly the same texture left by the movement of a river. We are all aware of the incredibly fluid motions of the snake or the eel. Water 
and the snake or the eel move in incredibly similar ways. The eel is, in that sense, water itself. And Aboriginal people would have been absolutely aware of that. The rainbow serpent across the continent takes many forms and sometimes he's a goanna. Here, in eastern New South Wales, it's the eel and also in the Murray-Darling system that is seen as the creator. But all have that fluidity of movement that can be seen in the movement of water in the landscape. This stretch of Uwebo on the bend in Argao Reach has had significant impact from flooding over the years and is known for erosion. If you continued walking beyond the end of the beach, you'll see a massive amount of sand which was deposited here during those floods. Please do take care if you're still walking. The river just upstream from here on Freeman's Reach nearly changed its course during flooding in the 1950s where it started cutting a new channel at the breakaway. Hawkesbury local Ron Mayles. I worked on Corvallis about the 56, round about there, when this big flood came, and from Freeman's Reach, where the bend in the river there, the river travels out round past Windsor and back to Wilberforce. Well, the distance across wouldn't be any more than two kilometres and the river just changed course and just cut a big channel right through from Freeman's Reach to Wilberforce. But the channel didn't go all the way. It ended up halfway, it cut it out. When you get to Wilberforce Road, Buttsworth Bridge, the road was normal there. But it just cut a channel where it first changed course right on the bend of the river at Freeman's Reach. Even on Freeman's Reach now, as you go around there, there's a playing field there and it's called the breakaway. And that's where the washed all road away. Enormous no, ravine. Hello, my name's Darren Blanch, local resident of the Hawkesbury. I grew up school captain at Wilberforce Public School. I spent a lot of time on the river. When we were kids, we used to go to play cricket for Freeman's Reach and we'd have cricket training, what the locals would know as the breakaway and there used to be a farmer across from the breakaway, the other side of the river on Cornwallis side, that used to grow watermelons. And our favourite part of going to cricket training on a Friday afternoon was swimming across the river and floating back one or two watermelons and, and as a kid's having a feast with the rest of the 11 and 12 year olds. I was never a very good swimmer, so it was a job and a half for me to get the watermelon back across the river because I was flat out supporting myself in the river. So it was one of, the, one of the fond memories of my childhood at 10, 11, 12 years old, yeah, swimming across the river and retrieving, stealing, retrieving, whichever way you look at it, a watermelon. Arthur Parks moved to a farm on the river in Cornwallis area as a boy in the 1930s. He was interviewed by historian Sue Rosen in 1992 when she was researching an environmental history of the catchment, which resulted in her book, Losing Ground. We started dairy farming at that time, 1934. All the river banks were completely denuded trees, there were no trees, and just grass over level banks, like a park, like banks they were. A lot of the banks since I've been here have cane, particularly the break white Windsor, the other side of Windsor between Windsor and Wilberforce, that breakaway is moved back south at least 100 yards. So we've been going down the point, cut in that side and moved up this side. And it's moved, oh, 300 yards since we've been here. They've had to move houses back and everything that's run near to it. Quite a lot of the other farms have moved. There's one farm in Cornwallis, and when the white man came here first and took it up, it was 40 odd acres, there's only two acres left on this side of the river now, all the rest on the other side of the river. It's cut one farm right away there. Mm. The river's still no wider than ever was. So it's built up it's on, the, on other the other side. side. The deepness of the river has changed quite a lot because there's been a lot of sand mined out of the river and a lot of metal gone out of the river. The metal there, right under all this area here. 
During major flooding in 2021 and 2022, the river washed away part of the road near the breakaway on Freeman's Reach side and cut a new channel on the Cornwallis side of the riverbank, making the road impassable. The first water brigade in New South Wales was established here in Windsor in 1869 to better manage flood rescue boats. This was just after the 1867 flood the biggest flood on record at 19 metres, which saw massive losses of stock, houses and farm buildings and the tragic loss of two families over the river from here at Cornwallis. When you're ready, head back in your own time to where we started. My name's Dr Michelle Ryan. I'm a lecturer in ecology and environmental science at Western Sydney University and I am the Hawkesbury Nepean waterkeeper. There's a huge abundance of plant and animal life in the Hawkesbury River and we have a really good variety of water bugs that make up that base of the food chain. So we have long-finned eels and short-finned eels. We have two species of freshwater turtles, Carladina longicollis, which is the eastern long-necked turtle. And we have a short neck species of turtles, Emidura macquarie. Emiduras we find in the river, they prefer flowing water, but the long neck turtles prefer wetlands and farm dams, so that's why we see them moving and crossing roads. We have some beautiful Australian native fish like bass. We've created a Hawkesbury and Nepean Waterkeeper Alliance to be a voice for the community for the river. My role as a waterkeeper is to listen to what people want and how they want to connect with the river, to facilitate workshops, to facilitate communications, as well as to collect data to be out on the river. We're really lucky to run a few workshop days. So we ran a microplastics workshop and at Windsor Beach. Microplastics are very well known to be in marine systems, but much less is known about them in freshwater systems. Treated sewerage gets discharged into the Hawkesbury Nepean River system. There's lots of microplastics in sewerage treatment plant discharge because microplastics are in things like our toothpaste, our cosmetics, and also in our washing, clothing, especially our towels shed a lot of microplastics and a lot of microfibers. So we ran a workshop for community members to learn how to take microplastic samples and do a count of microplastics in the area within a teaspoon size sample of the sand and sediment at Windsor Beach, which is about three grams, we found four pieces of microplastics. We had done a study there two years ago and we were getting up to 17 pieces per three grams. So this number's lower, but the floods uh, a couple of months before that brought a new inundation of sand. So those microplastics have only been gathering there for the last few months. And we expect when we go back this year, that there will be more microplastics there. We ran also a riparian assessment workshop. So riparian vegetation is everything on the riverbank. So all the plants, grasses, shrubs, trees. The riparian health in the Hawkesbury Nepean system at the moment is very poor. We've had huge amounts of erosion, huge loss of tall trees. Our shrub layers have died. Riparian zones that are healthy and that really do well in floodings are really complex systems. So they will be covered in grasses, covered in shrubs and have beautiful tall trees. And those trees really help in flooding with stability of the riverbank. All those shrubs, the grass layer kind of help absorb water and also slow down the flow. As part of the development of 11 stories from the River Drubbin project in 2019, art and music students from Windsor High came to the river here at Windsor Beach to respond creatively to the river and stories shared with them. I'm Casey. As a child, I visited a lot of different places along the river and I just love how the landscape changes, even subtly in the different places you can visit along the same river and how quiet and peaceful it can be, especially since it's so close to like suburbia and then almost a different world away from the city. So my name is Rico. I'm Indigenous, I'm not from Australia though. I'm a Māori from New Zealand, so I think I've always grown up for a uh, respect for the beauty of the natural things like rivers and uh, the water, love the water. 
I think something cool about the Ruru is its ability to gather people and to do recreational things and have fun. Because music is a lot of repeating patterns or you jump between different patterns, we're making ours quite repetitive and then there's the occasional like outlier that kind of represents a change in event. I'm Mia. I like the river because it's really adventurous. I like to do lots of bushwalking and hiking. What we're going to be doing is using watercolours and like objects from the river and leaves and stuff to create a picture or a collage or something. Water patterns were cool. When you throw something in the water, it kind of did like the same ring, every, like patterned every now and then. And we started uh, skipping some rocks and every time we got them to go in twos. They always jumped in twos and we were looking at trees and they usually in like groups of yeah, threes three. or twos. We were just looking at the patterns of nature and stuff. Strangers from afar, criminals up close, relentless before they steal away the river as their road. With their first contact lies, their guns and hounds and fires, shots and blood and dying culture, secrets and hidden desires. Hi, I'm Patrick. I just really love nature and how you feel isolated, yet you have a feeling of belonging. It can bring people together and inspire. I was looking at the grasses and the sand right down on the bank. So the grasses, like they're all in like V shapes. I found a lot of it. And along the banks, there are the lines showing where the different tides were and where the water is lapped and it's made all these nice lines that are a bit wavy at times, but mostly in a nice pattern. There's like a shine in the water at certain points in where the sun was like um, beaming down. Kind of bright. I'm just in Tar and the river. It's kind of an ideal place that I'd go when I want to have alone time or just to think out loud about stuff in life. And I think it'd kind of help me realize some things like to accept what comes and goes and yeah, just accept everything as it is. Didgeridgore, thanks for your company. We hope you've enjoyed 11 stories from the River Durabins Macquarie Park audiobook. For more information, please see Hawkesbury Regional Museum's website. There were 10 other audio walks along Durabins you might like to do. Nabalunya, see you soon. Remember Mika? softly on this dreaming. This country is alive with the Gumbada Wangan, the spirit of our ancestors. We were strong here. We remain strong here. We will always be strong here. Boreal.